Uh, thanks for joining Ben's Business Podcast. And uh, everyone to introduce from what I know about John F. Ketley is he's a, an investor in businesses, a mentor, and a turnaround growth and scale and exit specialist. Yes. So, John, I, I found out about you through my dad, who's actually in my office today. Um, me and my dad spend a lot of time together. We're both entrepreneurs. So I was growing up, brought, born as an entrepreneur, basically. And yeah. um, he is in the Harbour Club, Jeremy Harbour's club. And um, I've learned a lot about you through my dad. And I've also read your book, uh, How to Build a Business That Builds Wealth. And the subtitle of it, How to Stop Struggling and Start Thriving. So we can talk about your book as well especially because I have a book club, a business book club specifically. So would you like to give yourself more of an introduction? Who Who is John Ketley? Yes, by all means. Um, much like your good self, was uh, born a um, into a family of entrepreneurs, very, very fortunately. Um, it sounds more grandiose than it probably, than it actually <laughs> was. My, you know, I had various uncles one one had a um, a carpentry business. One had a butchers, uh, chain of butchers shops, and and so on. So these were all business owners, uh, not in the grand scale. So of course, I I kind of grew up with my uh, my uncle Peter doing this, and my uncle Sam doing that, my uncle Les doing something else. So kind of from a fairly early age, I knew I was never going to do the paye thing. It it, it just didn't really uh, come into focus and um, as we'll probably go into a little bit uh, later uh, I was blessed with a couple of badges that they give to the kids these days one's called dyslexia and the other's ADD so my attention span as a youngster uh, it's not much better today and I'm well into the the back end of the 50s um, was short so the best part of the last four decades, I start, build and sell companies. That's that's essentially what I do. Um, was fortunate, kind of took uh, a, a first of a number of retirements back in 06. Uh, fell into turning companies around after the last uh, recession of uh, nine ten, and mentoring businesses and then uh, taking stakes in various businesses with business owners who want to build to an exit. That's me in a nutshell. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Just to jump back to a point you said about uh, did you ever have a job or did you go straight into business? I left school at 15. Um, <laughs> okay. it's, it, it, the, the whole academia and, and getting jobs wasn't wasn't really on the on the cards at all. Right. And to be honest, back in the 70s, it, it wasn't as, uh, you know, perhaps as crucial as it is today to have qualifications and stuff like that. You could literally jump into something and then jump into something else. It's just how it was back in the 70s. Yeah. Okay. That's the okay. 1970s for all the millennials. <laughs> <laughs> and um, did you did you find business came naturally to you or did you have to develop skills and experience uh, before things started? Uh, again, for I was you? very fortunate because um, I've been, I suppose you call it hustling, from uh, from a kid because uh, I was very okay. fortunate to keep my span of attention under control and and use it to keep me in line. Uh, my parents very luckily bought me a, a dirt bike when I was ten, so by the time I got into my early teens, we were pretty much racing every Sunday through most of the year. So really, the only thing that existed to me was going uh, scrambling. They called it then motocross. They call it now uh, on a Sunday. So not being from a particularly um, wealthy family by any means. It was a case of paper rounds, washing cars, doing lots of different things just to raise the monies to make it work on a Sunday. So hence, it was kind of embedded from that young age. Yeah, I remember my dad's always called himself unemployable and uh, Correct. I probably That's... got that label as well. It's... <laughs> it's a personality type almost sometimes and uh, when you're born into that I think like I had my brother and my sister and I always found entrepreneurship and what my dad almost forced us sometimes to watch like uh, investor videotapes and 
<laughs> uh, yeah. I always found it a bit more interesting. So this definitely comes from your interest as well and who you are. Um, so I wanted to ask you, and it's quite a, a big question, but you in your book, you talk a lot about vision and purpose and being driven by that as the forefront picture versus just someone else's plan. Like you should do this versus you want to do that from an intrinsic motivation. So what is your ultimate goal, like your bigger goal for everything that you do today and what you've done? Well, that that really changes with time. Yeah. So uh, as a teenager, all I wanted to do was uh, be a professional um, motocross racer. Okay. Uh, and then um, the next part was I wanted to become a multimillionaire. And then the next part was I wanted to work in different parts of the world. And the next part, it changes. And, and I think the one thing that I've learned uh, over the years is never ever start and build a business that's that's a really really risky and bad thing to do it's much better to work out what it is that you want as a as an end result and then just reverse engineer that so uh for, for me personally starting a business normally begins with spotting something that other people haven't seen so when all the crowd is looking to the left you're you're far better to move to the right and look at what's going on so um an example of that is i come from a, uh, a town called stevenage stevenage was one of the five new towns after world war ii where all the londoners kind of moved out to and when they built stevenage they built a cycle track next to every main road around the town so there's miles and miles and miles of cycle tracks so uh, you're also allowed to use a moped up to 50 cc on these cycle tracks that are by every main road. So uh, one of the ventures that we did was, uh, was was a motorcycle store, and it was uh, it was because at the time petrol was becoming very very expensive. And the traffic in the town was a nightmare every morning and every evening in the two main industrial estates that surrounded Stevenage. So I thought, hmm, this is interesting. People are really watching where their money is and it's gridlock in those, in those areas. I think a lot of people would have a scooter as a second vehicle rather than a car as a second vehicle. And with that scooter, what they'd be able to do is avoid all of the traffic and because they're a scooter, they're allowed on the cycle tracks, hence avoiding the traffic. Two, they do 70, 80 miles to the gallon. And they're super cheap to rent. So that's why we opened up the scooter stores. So we would do a deal uh, and go to, so for example, I went to some blessed bakeries, which employed lots and lots of people in, in the bakeries there. Went to the personnel department and said, uh, I'm going to do a deal for all of your employees, if you'd like to put this on the board, that if they come into the shop and say that they work for some blessed bakeries, we'll give them a discount and we'll do them an unbelievable deal. For £99 down, 99 a month, we'll give them a crash helmet, waterproofs, gloves, a brand new Yamaha scooter and take them through their CBT to, to get their licence to be able to move. So that's how um, we uh, we got that particular store up and running. And Yamaha came to us um, probably only about five months after we started and said, how the hell are you guys selling so many units? We were the, 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 the biggest retailer of scooters in the country from zero to five months. And it was because we had a very structured plan to, to fill a hole that no one else was looking at. So that's what I mean by... When you're starting a business, you're looking for a hole to fill that others aren't doing. Two, I knew that I like starting businesses. I like building businesses. But as soon as they're operational, the ADD kicks in and I'm out. So I knew who was going to buy the business off of us. So that's what we were working to. Build, 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 sell. So that's really the kind of the, the mode that we've been working with for the best part of four decades is starting a business knowing we're going to sell it. So if you think about the people that start businesses, 
there are really only two types of people. Type number one is someone who's building a lifestyle business. And type two is someone who's building a business to sell at a certain point in time. Now, most small businesses are started by someone with a dream and they want to build a lifestyle business. And unfortunately, that's why they tend to crash and burn. And in fact, as we all know, 70 percent of businesses fail in the first five years. 50 percent of all businesses that start fail in the first two years. Um, and it's because they're that they're, they're starting the business not by reverse engineering it, but they're focused on the logo and the website and getting everything nice. And that's lovely until you get four or five months in and then the honeymoon's over. You've opened the business and it's off and running. And then you realize potentially, I think, that their sales and marketing strategies are not getting enough people to walk through the door and because they're not walking through the door there's not money going in the till to use that metaphor yeah so a couple of things there on the question of your purpose changes uh which makes me feel better actually because i'm always uh, like this is my purpose actually no this is my purpose five years later so it's good to yeah. hear that. It's, uh... Absolutely. And then what, what tends to also happen on that one, Ben, to, to segue back to your original question, is I don't know anybody in 40 years of being in business who's ever achieved their goal. And what I mean by that is think of it as a, a setting sail from the UK to the Americas. And you know you're going to America. And then about halfway across the ocean, all of a sudden, someone on the boat asks you, so where in America are we going? Now, for most people, America is success in this little story. They want to be a success. Mm -hmm. And then you say, so what does success look like? How will you know when you've won? And that's the point that stops 90% of people in their tracks. And they go, because yeah. um, they haven't viscerally worked out what the winning post looks like. So that's why in terms of, your direction it moves with the sands of time because what's important to you when you're 18 is not at 21 which is not at 31 which is not at 41 it changes so often what happens along the way is you see a, a different shinier star and you decide to, to to pivot and head off towards that shiny star as it were yeah, I've definitely noticed that now I'm 33, I've been through maybe two two of two or three of those phases. And it's it's quite a challenge actually at that that end of the 10 year cycle or whatever the cycle is, you you then don't find the thing that you were going for as motivating. So your priorities well, change. Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. And that's a that's a natural human thing. And I think the the thing to do is to is to notice that it's changed and not and this is what unfortunately an awful lot of people do is they'll keep rolling in the direction that they originally set out to and some people get very fixated said i will not move on until i've achieved that first goal mm -hmm. and sometimes that will take them an eternity to do that and for others it really mod motivates them which kind of brings you back to motivation so again motivation is 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 about knowing where you're going so if you aren't viscerally clear about that it takes all day to get nowhere <laughs> yeah um it's really really true and i think yeah we do need to just tap into our, our awareness like there's all these books that i've read and coaches and mentors and and these things help because when you come across like in your book the exercises and you as you really pointed out and brought up to my attention as well that re people really don't like to work smart no. and they they don't mind reading the book they don't mind doing 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 but it's when it comes back to actually sitting down and doing that personal development and business development time which is working on the business instead of in it that people 100%. people find it hard to come out of their habit of just doing and uh, I, even even myself like when you pointed that out I noticed myself going, oh, I want to 
I want to get on with all these little tasks that are in front of me. And then I'll come around to your um, your challenges or your your exercises that each chapter. So it's very true. And I think the people who take the time out to do those chapters at the end of the books uh, versus the people who don't will be more successful because they're working smarter. A hundred percent. I mean, it, it's interesting. Every year I invest in a fairly substantial learning of some description. So over the yeah. years, you know, that's been Tony Robbins, uh, Brendan Bouchard, Jim Rohn, uh, some Vince Lombardi, um, Zig Ziglar, uh, a number of things because, you know, knowledge is power, but knowledge is power only if it's if it's actioned and implemented. And it's interesting if I go back to um, the Tony Robbins uh, investment, which was, I don't know, 20 years ago. In fact, I'll tell you how old it was. You sent off and you got a box with uh, CDs in it and you would listen to the CDs. And there was, I don't know, 20 odd CDs or whatever it was in the training program that Tony Robbins was doing. And literally in the preframe, the very first CD, uh, Tony Robbins says to you, uh, the you know, the, the, the viewer or the listener, he says um, that through research that they've done, less than 70% of people get past CD3. Less. In fact, and I've got that wrong, less than 30%, over 70% don't get past CD3. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And that's very true because... I've, I've been to different things and I've seen different people that do what they call shelf development. They go on all these darn courses <laughs> to learn this, to learn that, and what have you. And then you'll see them at another course somewhere else. They've not implemented it. They've not got any further with it. Mm. They become course junkies. They just love yeah. going yeah. on courses. And the camaraderie and the rah-rah that you get on some of these two- and three-day courses. Yeah. No, that's it's really important that you – when these – exercises come up and uh, you're challenged you almost motivated to take action you should follow that and actually go and do something about it rather than like I got caught on that period as well like I read a lot of books and became very knowledgeable and and had lots of broad information and I felt myself anchored at a, f- a certain stage because I was really knowledgeable had lots of information but I wasn't you know exercising that information almost and ironing it out and it just got um like an anchor and i yeah. i felt like i i was actually lost in information rather than book do then then read the next book when you need it like just like someone calls it just in time learning yeah. so you're reading the book when it when it's the right time and and not just picking up a book to like you're saying shelf development just having uh, the books there and, and knowing that you've gone through the book and just tick it, tick off the book. Uh, I've I've most of the time never done that. I've always been quite good at listening to five minutes of a book, and there's a good action there that I can take and apply to. My, I've always had businesses to apply it to, so that really helps as well. Mm. So yeah, I totally agree with that. Excellent, excellent. Um, yeah. So uh, you said a few other things there as well about. Uh, what did you say? You've got dyslexia and ADHD? Yeah, but I don't really. Technically, yes. But I think um, I'll tell you a very quick story. About uh, in the mid 80s, um, an opportunity came to go out to West Germany to sell to the US military on the bases, uh, Jeeps and Harleys. And I thought that looks like that would be an adventure. You know, it was. Um, you know, there was uh, commission only and all the rest of it. It's as near as I come to a job per se is doing commission only things, which I've done many over the years. And uh, but it was predicated by this two week course. And I'm on the plane over to Frankfurt and I'm tying myself up in knots because I'm thinking I can't do the classroom thing. I just I, I won't be able to get past the classroom thing. So that was the first mistake was. I was talking myself into something that I wasn't able to do as opposed to talking myself into something. No, I'm going to take on board the learnings. I'm going to use this. And I wasn't thinking that way. I was thinking incorrectly. Anyway, course was run by an amazing guy, Tom Cavanaugh, XF-111 pilot, 
shot down over Vietnam, spent a couple of years in uh, up to his neck in water in a uh, Vietnamese prison war camp, PRW camp, and uh, went through some interesting stuff that he shared with us over a couple of weeks. Well, it was the first day, and it's on the first day, and I'm sitting in the chair, and there's about 20 other people that was in this boardroom. I'm thinking, it's going to be tough, it's going to be tough. So in walks Tom. And he didn't say a thing, got the attention of everyone in the room, pressed a button, and on the screen, and this amazing sound system in this boardroom, was the opening sequence of Top Gun. I'm thinking, okay, this is interesting. And so he had all of our attention straight away. Um, and then through the process of the next couple of weeks, what Tom was teaching was the psychology of communication. He was teaching how people are wired up. Late In later years, I uh, had a study in NLP, and, of course, a lot of what he was teaching was a military version of NLP, how to read people. So from their eye patterns, tell which of their two senses are their primaries over their, uh, over the other three. How, when people talk, how to get into rapport very, very quickly by using um, words that they use, talking to them in their language to speak up when people want you to speak up, to speak fast when people really want you to speak, or to slow it down. So using uh, intonation, cadence, and all of these other things to get rapport, and then from rapport to really be able to find out very quickly, but very elegantly, what that person really, really wants. Because then if you're in business, sales, if you can find out what your customer or potential customer really, really wants in minutes, it really massively increases your ability to earn because it massively increases your ability to sell more of the products and services that you sell. So it was at that point, as I say, two two weeks in with Tom Kavanagh, and he's teaching you how people process information, how they do this and how they do that. And so the question was asked many, many times. So if, if, if I'm talking to someone who's a fast processor or a slow processor, which is the best? He said, there is no best. If people process the world around them very quickly, then that's how they do that, or very slowly. And then someone would ask and say, well, what if, uh, is it better to be visual or is it better to be auditory? He said, it doesn't matter. How you're wired up is how you are wired up. So if you're dyslexic, it was really only kind of coming onto the map in the mid 80s. If you're dyslexic or you've got ADD, ADD is just another word for you've got a very fast processor. And so what you'll find is a lot of race car drivers have a very fast processor. They can process information so much quicker. It's not about reaction times. It's about the speed at which you can process information. So you tend to find that fast processors are people that do very, very well in the entrepreneurial space. Not always, because a very good friend of mine is an unbelievably slow processor. Drives me insane because we're at opposite ends of the tantrum. But she is a phenomenal businesswoman. I really have the most respect for her because, okay, she, she processes it slowly, but she'll go click, 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 and then she'll know exactly what to do. There's no prevarication in it. So again, if you're dyslexic or you're ADHD or any of the other badges that people, you know, I have a degree of neurodivergence. I can think of and process five different subjects at a time. And if I only have one subject to focus on at a time, I start blowing a few fuses. I have to have a number of things going on. So I spent last Friday night in the A&E with uh, my mum, bless her. We, we took her into hospital. And if you're sitting in an emergency room, every minute feels like 20 minutes when you, you've got a fast processor. So that kind of like 14, 16 hours was like weeks to me. So I had to have different things that were going on in the brain. So it's not good. It's not bad, but it's really, really handy if you can look in the mirror and get comfortable with who's looking back. So if you was any of these badges that they hand out to kids at school. Um, and this is the problem. They hand them out to the kids at school and that's their excuse not to achieve. Whereas to me, that's, 
you know, most dyslexic have got a higher IQ than normal. Most ADHD have got a higher IQ. You just got to feed that. So they're coming at this in the schools largely the wrong way. I'm, I'm not going to suck myself into a into a black hole there with people saying, John, what are you saying? But I think it's an advantage. And I think everybody needs to look at what their advantage is. And then when it comes to their career and business and what they do in, in becoming a success, you have to start the marker. I mean, you've read the book, Ben. It, it's really a personal business development book. And there's a heavy emphasis, as you know, in the first chapters around the personal. It then goes on to the business. Making money is easy. And I say that not glibly because I know so many people find it difficult. But the reason they find it difficult is because they haven't worked out the personal part first. As in, what is winning to you, the person in the mirror? Yeah, not anyone else, not what you should be, which is what you was alluding to earlier. Oh, I should have done this by now, or I should have done. That's just shooting all over yourself. That's that's a negative. It's far better to say, do you know what? I've made a few mistakes along the way, and that's okay. I'm stronger and more learned for them. But now I need to be able to look in that mirror and say, this is who I am. You're good at X, you're good at Y, you're good at Z. And not what most people do. What most people do is, you know, well, you're not very good at this. You're not very good at that. So you need to avoid this. You need to avoid that. And they're actually taking themselves on a negative trail. You're never going to make money at that. You're never going to succeed if you're taking down the negative trail. And that's why you see with most entrepreneurs that have reached a degree and even a high degree of success, they all talk about the mind behind success. And it is the mind behind success. It's the, it, it's the difference that makes a quantum difference. One degree of moving yourself into the positive over the negative makes a thousand degrees of a difference. Yeah. And the reason I asked you, obviously, about uh, dyslexia and things is just interesting. Uh, I'm dyslexic and um it made school a wee bit difficult for me uh, until I found my feet and probably pretty much got out of school. And then that's when I started to thrive in life. Uh, and like you say, I, I'm I'm on track and agree with uh, what you've been saying there about. And it is, uh, I, when I think about what you're saying, I think about self-awareness, just knowing who you are. And like you're saying, loving yourself for who you are and uh, thriving from your, your own aspects that are good, not what, um, other people are good at and owning that. So then when you get, like you're saying, almost bored when it gets into the operation side of the business, that's when you sort of delegate it to the rest of the people who can who do well in that. So that makes a lot of sense to me and how how I'm approaching life and how uh, fast processor that really stick to, that stuck with me as well that I can totally relate sitting in that um, waiting room and it being a long uh, a long wait. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, I think it really just comes back to that principal thing that you must know yourself. You must know who you are. Positives, negatives, take the negatives and leave them. No one's interested in them. Everyone else is going to point them out to you. Uh, it, it's really just staying with the positives. Well, look, I'm pretty good at X and I'm pretty good at Y. OK, so how do I leverage that? And being yes. very conscious of language. So if, if so, for example, with language, I mean, this is the kid that left at 15. I'm, I'm still a bit crap with spelling and grammar, but I'm reasonably articulate because I've, I've read a bit and I've traveled the world a little bit. But if you look at uh, uh, and this is why I really picked up on psychology and linguistics. So if you say, look, how are you going to get from where you are to where you want to be? That pretty much locks everybody's brain up. Whereas if you say, so what are you going to do to move from where you are to where you want to be? How is a stationary word and what is a motion word? So if you keep asking people, well, how are you going to do this and how are you going to do that? You'll get no feedback from them. You know, you talk to a, a potential customer and say, well, look, how will you know that this is the right product or service for you? Or, or how are you thinking you're going to get nothing? Whereas if, you say, whereas if you use the what word, it's a motion word. That's what gets people to, to make decisions. 
Okay, that's yeah, that's really interesting. I've not come across that before. Um, so I picked up a lot of good tips about sales and marketing in your book and off the top of your head, like what would you say is the best advice you can give in sales or in marketing? I particularly liked uh, some of the information you shared about prospecting and closing, uh, market and talking about sort of the USP. But um, yeah, what would be your best advice to say a, a medium sized or even a startup business owner? Because there is a quite a lot of startup business owners who are in my audience. Yeah, so to the startup guys, um, <clears throat> because that, that, that there's there's different answers depending on who's asked, asking the question and where they are on their journey uh, and how they see the world. So I think if we start with the uh, with sales and then we'll go to marketing. Okay. So if you ask most people, have you done any sales training? Most will say no. And then you'll ask, because I've asked this question of thousands of people over the last kind of 15 odd years. Um, and say, so wh wh why have you not invested in, in learning how to sell? Well, I don't want to be salesy. Okay. How's that working out? Well, so that's what you'll get as an answer is, oh, well, you know. Now, here's the thing. Everyone's perspective, if, if you ask someone to describe a salesperson, what they'll generally describe is what we think a car salesman, insurance salesman, double glazing salesman. That's what they'll describe as a salesperson. And it's a very it's a quantum difference in the UK to the US. In the US, a professional salesperson is on a pedestal is right he she or they are right up there because to be a professional salesperson is actually about being a professional communicator you see the art of sales is in never been seen to be selling because the second that someone detects that you're selling to them they switch off and they leave think about the last time you went to buy a product that was fairly substantial in price it might have been you know uh, a suit for a wedding it might have been a new settee or a car or some home improvement the second you detected that person was selling you you kind of ran away didn't you everybody Thanks. does it's human nature we've been programmed by the media for the last 30 years not to make decisions and if someone's trying to sell to you to run away so they do so professional salespeople don't look like one don't sound like one the art of selling is a conversation between two people at the end of which one just buys from the other and that my friends is the trick it's to have a conversation that is eloquently elegantly easy that just helps the other person to buy what it is that they want so that's a learned skill. You're not born a sales salesperson. You're you're born a baby. <laughs> you learn these things, these skills. So I think, and and actually, I'm going to put my hands up here. I'd say that most of the sales courses that I've been on over the years are a bit 1970s, 1980s. They're not really teaching. So I'm contradicting to, to, to a degree, but there are some really, really good sales trainings out there where you can learn about how to detect, how to read body language, how to, to get somebody to be really, really comfortable to tell you what it is they really, really want, as opposed to the smoke screen stuff that they tell you in the, in the early parts of a conversation. So my uh, advice would be learn how to become an excellent communicator number one number two would be to research what your three customer avatars really are who they really are so the people that really want to buy what you sell why 
What's the three things they most desire about the product or the service that you provide? What's the three things in their life that they really don't want? So if you've got the three desires and the three pains in their life, and then you can merge those pains and and desires, the, the carrot and the stick, into the offering, when it comes to marketing, the offer resonates. So we want to do that for each of the uh, client avatars that we have. So your core potential customer and that customer that's kind of two degrees to the left and the customer that's two degrees to the right. And I don't really care what it is that you're selling. Everybody's got the same principles in hand. I mean, over the years, we've had CCTV access control. um, We've had a deli cafe, a restaurant. uh, There are all number of things that we've done over the years and the law doesn't change people buy from people then they buy from the company and the last thing they actually buy into is the product or the service so these you'll read in variations in books since the beginning of time yeah really good advice and i've studied a lot on sales i believe i'm a good salesperson and got out of that idea about sales being a a yucky thing like a a sleazy sales sale car sales person like it's it is the complete opposite of that it's being it's really understanding people to a deep understanding who you're actually selling to and being communicating and list listening and then communicating and with their actual motives 100%. I mean, if you take the car salesman, the kitchen salesman, the double glazing sales guy, uh, or, you know, male or female, um, do you think that when that car salesperson goes into work on a Saturday morning, knowing that they're going to speak to 10, 20, 30 people that day, they're going to get husbands on their own. They're going to get wives on their own. They're going to get husbands and wives. They're going to get single people. They're going to get a whole mix of people that's going to stream through their door on an average Saturday. And every single one of them is going to walk in there thinking, I'm not going to let that car salesman get me. Yeah. Like all of them. So if you're the car sales person, the male or the female, right? Every single person that talks to you is going to have their barriers up at the ceiling, aren't they? So. If you think about it, if that's the case, then those characters have to be phenomenal professionals to be able to drop all those barriers. Yeah. The double glazing guy. The, those hardcore salespeople that we think of as salespeople, none of them look like salespeople. Well, yeah. not if they want to wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and. Yeah, I think that really covers marketing as well. What one of the questions I asked. So, um, I have a, a selfish personal question. Far away. <laughs> a specific uh, thing that's a couple of deals that are happening right now for me. I have a, a, a company and a competitor that I've offered to grow their business and be a 20% shareholder. Again, I am really winging this and uh, learning as I go on how to structure these deals. But essentially, I would be a a shareholder, 20%. I would earn 20% of the dividends and be paid as well as a consultant in a market. I have a marketing agency. So I would be growing their business with what I know how to grow their business through digital marketing and through my understanding of growing a business through the systems, through the, the people. And that that would be my approach to growing this business. I've done that for my, myself and other clients. So I'm my question to you is, I know that you do mergers, merging and acquisitions, m and and I was just wondering what would how would you come in as a business consultant in a situation like that and how would the structure be? Okay. Um very much the same lines as as uh as anything in business, whether you're again selling 
uh, B to B, B to C, or um, you know, uh, B to uh, government, B to G. It, it's it's always around the person, always. And so, if uh, so, I, I've been in the mergers and acquisition space now for a number of years. Um, up until about ten years ago, mergers and acquisitions was really the place where. Uh, the big corporates lived. It, well, it didn't really exist in the SME, the small and medium enterprise arena. So this kind of loops us back to uh, business owners, whether they're a startup or they are had the business for 40 odd years. What they are is very, very good at what they do. You know, they're, they're brilliant bakers of cakes or they're brilliant fixers of motorcycles or they're brilliant manufacturers of disc brakes yeah. for trains, whatever that may be, okay? But what most aren't are very good at selling a company. It's a very, very different thing. So if you're buying companies or selling companies, it's a very different set of dynamics. People are more precious about their business than they are about their children. I know this is a big statement, but it's true. They are more precious about their business than their relatives and everyone around them, which means that by and large, especially if you're working with someone who's had a business for 10, 20 odd years, and they've gone through blood, sweat, and tears. They've been awake at night. How are we going to make payroll? How are we going to pay HMRC? They've gone through all the toils. And don't forget, there's only one person in the United Kingdom that is allowed to earn less than minimum wage. Business owners. Business owners are allowed to earn nothing. Everybody else has to get at least minimum wage. And if you talk to a vast majority of business owners, they kind of just make ends meet. And I'm talking about millions of these across the United Kingdom. And what tends to happen is, is they will not go and get help until the last minute. They won't. So they don't search for a business coach. They don't search for someone to come in and help them. They won't do that until the very last minute. And at the last minute, what they tend to do is they'll ask people around them and say, look, keep this card. Do you know anyone that... And that's how they find business coaches, business mentors, or m and people like us. So what do we bring to the table? We bring clarity, knowledge, connections, and experience. That's what we bring to the table. So when we're sitting down with a business owner, the very first thing that we need to do is we need to understand them as a person, the business, and then back to them as a person. So that's the sequence. And going back to them and say, look, what is it that you really, really want? And most of them will say, uh, um, um, they won't know. So our job is to help them to gain clarity about what it is that they really, really want. So some of them, just to, to be able to sleep at night. Some of them, it's... I want to sell this business in the next three years and I want to walk away with a million pounds. Okay, cool. What does it turn over at the moment? Well, it turns over 500K. Okay. And what do you, what do you do EBITDA? Okay, what's EBITDA? Well, it's net profit before tax. Oh, okay. Well, we make about 100 grand. Okay. So you make 100 grand a year and you want a million pounds for this. So that's going to take some, whoever buys your business, 10 years to be money back before they earn a nickel. Would you do that? Would you work for 10 years for no money? Would you? No, they won't either. So it, it, it's having a conversation where you're you're detailing out what it, or rather you're learning, you're qualifying in the early stages, what it is that they really, really want. Once you know what the driver is, what the motivational point is, that now you can begin. Now you can begin. So, well, okay, fine. So if that's what you want, the next thing that we need to do is find out the gap, the gap between what they want and where they are today. So this is why I, I don't really care. If they say they want 10 million for it, no problem at all. We can, we can get you 10 million for that business. It's going to take us about 15 years to do it, Really? Well, yeah, because it's worth like 200 grand. 
<laughs> so it, it's about balancing expectations. Every business owner wants uh, wants twelve pound for a ten pound note. Every business owner, because of the blood, sweat, and tears they put into it, they're not looking at it through the lens of a buyer. So, in your in your particular case, does the guy that you're talking to does does he, she, or they? want to build this business as a lifestyle business or do they want to build it to an exit i'm actually unsure about that i i would lean towards a lifestyle business okay what lifestyle do they want to get by maybe show up to some meetings sales meetings and that's about it eventually no, no. What, what lifestyle do they want lifestyle so, yeah yeah what what so if they're building a lifestyle business what lifestyle do they want right so for some they will say to you i want to be able to go home at five o'clock on a friday evening and not think about it till monday yeah because they're working 24 7 365 that's what yeah. their life's been yeah okay we can make that happen what we're gonna to have to do is put in the processes and the strategies to make the business much more efficient work better so that you can sleep at night and it makes more money another character is going to say well actually ben i want to build a business that gives me a hundred thousand pounds a year i spend three days a week in it and i can go on holiday for six weeks come back and it still works and works effortlessly without me that's what i mean by what lifestyle do they want because i can't reverse engineer nebulous I have to get clarity about what that business owner really wants because only then can we start putting a deal together. Up until that point, and this is where I think a lot of M&A guys go wrong, is they go, well, I could do this for them and I could do that. No, 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 stop all that. Stop all that. Yeah, so it's about not making assumptions on the, the seller. They, they will tell you what they were looking for. Do you know what? You've just hit on... Uh, my number one subject that I, I, I teach in every trainings that, that we do. Um, and it's about how we process information and everything else. And that is, we have not, as a species, developed the ability to read minds. We haven't done it. So if we think they think, it means that we don't know. So if we think about a certain customer. I think they want to buy this. Well, why do you think that? Have you asked them? Or I think they want, whoa, 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 stop. Have you asked them? We must know. There are things we must know. We can't think because then we're mind reading. <laughs> yeah, definitely don't make assumptions. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So just understand what they, they really want from the lifestyle, like you say, just like what we should do for ourselves when we are planning absolutely. our own life. Absolutely. Planning our life, then our business, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that probably answers the other question about, like, when to exit. At what stage do you decide to exit? Uh, again, that is... Um... Ask 10 people, get 10 answers yeah, on that yeah. particular question. So for me, I normally pick a number. So, okay, I'm going to build this over three years and I'm going to walk away with 2 million, 1 million, 8 million, whatever that might be, yeah? Um, for other people, it could be, I'm working until I'm 45. I want to retire at 45. For another person, it'll be, I want to do another 10 years of this and then I'm out. Right. And then when you ask them, why 10 years? And I go, well, that's what I want to do. Okay. And what are you going to walk away with in 10 years' time? Um, see, they're not clear. Mm. It's nebulous. So I think for each person, there must be a reason. So I was talking to someone only a couple of weeks ago, and um, they really didn't know what they wanted. So when I so I've got a certain way with people that I, I kind of take them on a little journey anyway. On that particular little journey, what it came down to, this guy 
wasn't motivated by business. What he really, really wanted was him and his girlfriend wanted to go around the world in a camper van. That's what they wanted. And he wanted to have enough money to do it without worrying about money. Okay, I said, okay, so what camper van do you want to use? How much will it cost to get that ready? Okay, what do you what do you want to have as a comfortable number to spend each and every week? Right, triple that. Triple that number, okay? Uh, double the price of the camper and triple the amount you think you need on a week by, on a weekly basis and double the, the term that you think is going to take you to go around the world. That's the number. He said, okay. He said, right. Now we know what we're what we're, we're up against. When do you want to do this by? He said, I want to do this by the time I'm 34. I said, why 34 and not 35? He said, because my girlfriend will be 30 and I want to do it for her 30th. Okay, that's a good enough reason. I can run with that. So let's do this then. And we put a plan together. Yeah, and that's and a good question on top of that is, like, what questions... And this could apply to sales, to market research, to negotiation. What questions are good questions to ask people to learn about them and understand them to, so that you don't have to mind read? Depends on the scenario. So um, say, for example, um, someone's coming in to buy a car. I'm going to ask them, so tell me, how long have you had the car that you have now oh, i've had it for four years oh really and um what made you buy that car well i really uh, i really only bought it because it was the right price at the time and we needed a car oh okay so it wasn't the car of choice no if you'd had a choice what would you have bought what am i asking i'm asking about their motivations is what i'm asking yeah i'm asking what what the drivers are and so in we're kind of looping back to sales again uh in so the questions i always think of it as temporal i have a temporal conversation so i have questions from the past that bring me up to today then i leap over today into the future and then i'll ask about what it looks like sounds like feels like to them a year or five years from now depending on what it is that we're we're putting together for them today yeah so we're talking with uh i was in uh uh in orlando last november at an it conference and we're talking to a business owner who wants to sell the business for five million and he wants to do it within the three in, in the next three years so i said to him why three years i said so in fact let's go back in time why did you start the business what because i need to understand you need to understand we need to understand as as sellers of a service or a product the psychology of the person that we're talking to what makes them tick and we do that via the temporal conversation and this is why i'm saying to you there's a whole lot more to selling is understanding how people connect dots what speed they connect the dots what's important to them not what we think based on what is important to us because that may mean nothing to them yeah, it's, it's like marketing. I've studied a lot of marketing and advertising and, and sales market and advertising, whatever it is, even negotiation. It all comes down to the negotiation, the the the, the human mind and how we tick. Um, I remember in a book, David Ogilvy about advertising, he talked about a really, really good advertiser. I can't remember his name. But he described the guy as a philosopher, not as an advertiser, because he was so clued up as a philosopher yeah. or a psychologist would be about human behavior. That that's what made him a good um, advertiser. So that sort of ties in with what you're you're talking about here. So do you think negotiation is quite similar to sales in that in that way? The, 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 it's a fusion. It, they are the same yeah. thing. They are the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Because that is one thing I picked up on reading your book and getting to know you through your book that you have a really broad uh, and and deep understanding of business, sales, marketing, negotiation, all, all of the aspects of business. And again, 
I, I've studied, so it takes one to notice one and notice that one's even further on. And uh, yeah, that's one thing I picked up about you that you were using like words like preframing, which is a word that I've not really got in my lingo on a day to day and just all these different understandings of the maybe the, the three aspects of negotiation, sales and marketing. No, well, picked up on, as you say, it's, um, you know, I'm a novice at this. I, I'm really just scratching the surface, but <laughs> I'm endeavouring to become better at it. Um, and I think that if you've got that thirst for learning and you don't have an ego about, oh, look at me, I've done X or I've done Y, people don't like that. They don't like that. Mm. You know, and I think the funny thing is, is, is as you get older, you become a more humble person. Um, I mean, at, at 22, I was your typical know-it-all um, pain in the ass kid at 22. I look back at him and it's embarrassing, <laughs> but that's okay. We can all look back at 22 and be embarrassed. I mean, the, the funny thing is when you look at fashion today, I look at people with, you know, whatever they're wearing and thinking, you wait 10 years and that photograph's going to come out of what you look like today and you're going to wince. <laughs> I know because <laughs> I am about <laughs> what the fashions were in the 70s and the 80s and even the 90s and mm. and, and so on. So we're all learning. Yeah, yeah. we're all learning. Yeah. And a few, like, I'm looking for some, uh, like, five short answers for the next few questions because uh, I try and keep these um, calls to a minimum, a maximum sure. of about an hour. So do you take time off? Yes. Let me add another question to that. How often do you take time off? Okay, so what I tend to do, my what my process is when when the when the light starts coming down to like four o'clock, um, I'm I'm back up to like kind of five six, sometimes seven days a week, right the way through till uh, about now. As soon as that light lifts again, uh, I don't do Mondays, I don't do Fridays, and I don't do Wednesday afternoons. Um, so. Wednesday afternoon is to ride a dirt bike. Uh, Friday is just because I don't. Why, why would you work Friday? Don't want to do that. Mondays don't really do Mondays. Uh, I haven't really done Mondays for twenty years. So that's not to say that I don't do stuff on a Monday. I just don't tell the world I do too much on a Monday or a Friday. Um, only in recent years, this was a mistake I made over the last X number of decades, not not having enough quality time. But having said that, my passion was business. I like business. I like eat, sleep, drink, think. You know, my wife kind of looks at me and says, you know, that, that's like the other wife is business because I, you know, I'm passionate about it. I love the hustle. I love spotting what other people haven't seen. So to me, that's a bit like another character's you know, uh, playmaking. So yes, I take time out much more so now. I'll take a month here and a month there and so on. Right. Okay. So you have two wives. Three. <laughs> Three. <laughs> okay. Um, what would be a, a routine? I remember reading your book, you talked about before you have that second coffee, do some prospecting. So what would be a, a routine for you, a daily a day routine? um yeah again that shifts uh so for me uh on a personal level as soon as i wake up in the morning i'll go through a sequence of gratitude in my mind that that lasts probably about 10 minutes and then from the sequence of gratitude i then go to another three questions and okay so what will make today outstanding what's the one thing that if i achieve it will make me smile most who do I need to release today? Release out of my life. Let that be business or personal, as the case may be. And then, and then it's a case of uh, you know, you know, you go through your other routines and what have you. And then I do not look at emails till eleven o'clock. It's against the law because emails is a box of other people's desires. Yeah. It's like a to-do list that other people want you to do. <laughs> um, biggest mistake that you or you've seen others make? 
the biggest mistake I made was um, was continuing to do something that I didn't want to do. The biggest mistake I see other people make is not stopping to calibrate where they are in their life, business life, but life. If you don't stop and get off the bus, the next thing you know, years follow. So the glass, the sand falls through the glass so damn quick that it goes from Tuesday to the following Thursday, then it's a month later, then it's a year later. Um, people set fire to too much time, and it's because they don't stop to look in the mirror and say to the guy in the mirror or the woman in the mirror, are you still on course? Are you doing what you want to do? Are you really in charge of your own life? So the, the big questions. Mm -hmm. And any final messages that you'd like to share? I think probably the, the one that I've been repeating all the way through is you must know who you are. So if you are not 100% happy with where you are in your life, work out what will make you 100% happy. Notice I took the positive angle on that. If you're not happy now, what would make you happy? What is winning to you? I mean, when I say what is winning, 99 out of 100 people say, I don't know what you mean by winning. What do you mean winning? Well, let me explain what winning is to me. I don't have an alarm clock. I haven't had one for 20 plus years. I wake up when I wake up. I only do what I want to do. I don't work with idiots. I do not work with people that I don't want to work with. I only work with people I do want to work with. So I walk to my own tune. I do what I want, when I want, how I want, with who I want. That's winning. Did you hear me mention money? No. There you go. Yep. And for people on how where are you most active on social media or where can people find you and follow you and and get uh, advice to be honest, I, I, I don't do a great deal linkedin is where you'll see me post different okay. things uh on uh john f ketley because there is another john ketley and he tells the weather yeah yeah that was uh, i was looking at your seo beforehand and mm -hmm. <laughs> seen your competition with a famous weatherman hence the f for francis yeah okay and i want to give obviously people a, a screenshot if they can of your book uh, i really enjoyed it i find that i'm gonna have to go back and do the the exercises because sometimes i was caught driving and pulling over and sometimes not being able to pull over and do the exercise let me ask you a question ben if i may yeah go ahead having gone through the book what's the one thing that leaped out at you hmm I think uh, one of the reasons I was drawn towards you to come and interview you as well is I think the fact your ma your main message at the end there uh, is very linked with that that you're not just about business and you believe in the idea of success is personal and it has to be through you not from your dad not from your mum not from other people society it has to be your your vision, your purpose, or it won't be success. You 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 won't be happy. So that was a big yeah. message I got. Uh, just the personalization of your book. Good, good. I, I, I'm really, really, really pleased about that because it kind of comes back to uh, the great metaphor: is that if if you're on a plane and it's it, you know it's on fire or whatever you've got to put your oxygen mask on first mm. if you don't put your oxygen mask on first you run the risk of you might only save one of the or four family members on the plane put your oxygen mask on first you survive you can get to look after the other people and this is a thing only when you are happy in yourself and when you're achieving can you then start looking out after other people and this goes with the kind of the Tony Robbins thing is that you go through various phases in your life and you will eventually, I don't care who you are, eventually you get to a point where you're on the throne of your life, looking back across it and you're thinking, did I really put as much in as I could have? Did I look after all the people that I should have looked? And a thousand tears have been said by or a thousand 
tears have been shed over things that were never said. So that's why it's important to be comfortable in your own skin first, because if you're an unhappy person, you're never going to make the people around you happy. Yeah. And that is in business. Yeah. Thank you for joining, John. I really enjoyed this. Pleasure. I hope everyone got value. And if you have any questions, leave it in the comments and hopefully we can get around to answering them later. Thanks again. This will be shared onto Apple Podcasts. It will be uploaded to YouTube so people can watch the replay. Thanks. Splendid. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.